So good morning, everyone. So we're going to start the morning session. Our first speaker is uh, David Sosa from uh, CNRS in Paris, and he will uh, tell us about resurgence and partial the the theories. Thank you, Frédéric. Well, it's my pleasure to thank the organizers of this workshop and of this wonderful program um, in the Isaac Newton Institute. I'm very happy to be again here. Uh, so today, I would like to present this uh, joint work. Um, you can have the presentation slides, if you wish, uh, on the website. This is from the Newton Institute webpage. So, um, Resurgence and Partial Theta Series, this is a joint work with um, uh, Li Han, Yong Li, and Shan Jung Sun. And this has triggered the collaboration with Jorgen Andersen and William Mistergaard. Um, so, we, we are going to consider partial theta series, that is, uh, functions of tau defined by such a formula. So it's a partial theta series because the summation runs for only positive integers n, not the full lattice z. Uh, it makes a difference because this sequence a n is supposed to be periodic or n power nu times a periodic sequence. So we are given, we are given an exponent nu here. We are given a periodic sequence f of period m, and we have this Fourier expansion, if you wish, which is certainly convergent for imaginary part of tau positive. Um, and here, well, this division by m is just a convenient normalization, obviously. And nu will be 0 or 1. And in fact, nu equal 2 already, you get it by differentiating with respect to tau. So it doesn't matter very much. So nu is, think of nu equal to 0 or 1. And think of this as a function of tau, holomorphic and 2m periodic in the Poincaré half plane. And it's holomorphic in the point I have planned, but we're interested in asymptotics as tau tends to the origin or to some rational point on the boundary of the point carré half plane. Asymptotics. Um, we will see uh, that there is a limit at many rationals. So this will allow us to define a function, a limit function. I call it theta nt. The nt refers to non-tangential, the way we approach. The, it, it can be radial limit, it can be vertical, but it can be anything in a sector of opening less than pi. So it's a non-tangential limit at certain rationals. So those rationals, I call them, well, elements of QFM. That would be the quantum set if you think that Q is exponential 2 pi i tau and if you know a bit of topological quantum field theory, but I won't go into the details, I want to keep this talk uh, rather elementary. So there, is a, there will be a set on which this limit exists, and this defines hence a 2m periodic function on this subset of the rationals. And um, well, you can believe easily that we need a condition. For instance, does the limit exist at the origin? Well, if you s brutally substitute tau equals 0 in, this, in the series, in the expression, well, you are summing a n. If imagine all the a n are positive, or <laughs> well, certainly you need something like mean value of f to be 0. That's more reasonable to hope for. Uh, in, in fact, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the limit. And not only we have a limit when this mean value is 0, but we have two resurgent series, two divergent series, which play a role. And one depends on the odd part of our ingredient here, f, and the other depends on the even part of the function f. So we will see how these two series interact, and they allow us to understand fully the asymptotics as tau tends to 0. So that's the origin. but. In fact, if you change your base point, if you go to alpha now, well, by shifting the variable, you are just modifying the function. Well, it's an easy computation. I don't want to do it on the blackboard, but you can believe that replacing a zero by alpha amounts to 
replacing the periodic function f or period m by some other periodic function with a new period. Um, you see, you have, uh, when you shift, you have exponential i pi n square alpha over m. Now, alpha over m is rational, so this exponential i pi n square beta, when beta is rational, has its own period, and you have f periodic, so you take the, the least common multiplier of the two periods, and, and you have a new periodic function which gives you everything at alpha. So the conclusion, for instance, if you believe the first claim that you just need this criterion of the mean value, then you have a description of the, the quantum set where the limit exists in terms of vanishing of mean values, but of course, this, mean, this is the mean value of a periodic function on the integers. It's a kind of quadratic Gauss sum. So if um, alpha has a large denominator, you have a huge computation to make, but that's a criterion. So from our analysis at tau going to zero, we can deduce everything at any alpha, but the price to pay is this uh, complexity in the periodic function. Okay, so before I give you the details for this um, story, let me remind you of Eccal's definition. So here I'm following Eccal's um, framework uh, as I learned it from Candel Perger, Nospas Femme, a famous book in the 90s. Um, a resurgent series, what is it? Any formal series whose formal Borel transform is an endlessly continuable germ. So how do you define the formal Borel transform? In this talk, tau is going to zero, so the usual standard resurgence variable would be z1 over tau, so which means that uh, it is tau to the n plus one that you replace by xi n over factorial n, or more generally, you can allow for non-integer powers, provided they have positive real part. You see, we are dealing here with an infinitesimally, well, a formally infinitesimal monomial, something which tends to zero and tau tends to zero, and in that case, you get this xi to the mu minus one over gamma of nu, which is well defined. And so what does it mean that the formal Borel transform is endlessly continuable? The formal Borel transform, you just apply term-wise this Borel transform and you get a formal series. You assume it to be convergent near the origin. And now if you have not only integer powers, maybe you get a Puiseux series or some kind of expansion, but it is supposed to be convergent. Let's say there is a psi to power c in front. In our case, often we will have c equal one half. This is why, I, I, or minus one half. Um, so what does it mean to be, co to be endlessly continuable? It means one can follow the analytic continuation of that germ along any finite path starting near the origin and avoiding a finite subset of the Riemann surface of the logarithm. So the point is there are no natural barriers, only isolated singularities. Um, you can think of a meromorphic function that would be the easiest example of endlessly continuable germ or algebraic function. And in this talk, we will find in the Borel plane something very simple. We will find a subset of the upper imaginary semi-axis. So we will define points, so that will be the xi variable uh, after Borel transform, and we will have these points. And well, maybe the origin is a singularity, but a mild singularity because you see, we, we require integrability at the origin in the variable xi. Okay, um, now uh, a resurgent function is anything you can obtain, uh, an analytic function that you can obtain from a resurgent series by Borel-Laplace summation. So we have described that arrow, the formal Borel transform, and then you want to apply a Laplace transform in some direction theta, and if that's possible, the result is, the outcome is called a resurgent function. So you recall that we are using the Laplace kernel associated with um, tau going to zero. So the Laplace kernel is exponential minus psi over tau, so this is the, the formula. And we have the usual statements, the Watson lemma, etc. So in particular, the function that you define this way um, is asymptotic 
to that series as tau goes to zero. And in fact, it, this asymptotic property can be qualified. It's a one Gevre asymptotic. Uh, anyway, we call S theta the Borel Laplace sum in direction theta, so the composition of these two maps. And uh, we will use also the median summation. So what's that? Uh, you see the script here. It's one of ECAL's average Borel Laplace summation operators. So um, imagine a situation like this. Typically, you will have a lateral, a lateral right summation using theta of the form pi over 2 minus something. You will have a lateral left summation with angle theta pi over 2 plus epsilon and they won't necessarily coincide if there are singularities on that array. So which means that you have naturally defined two lateral Borel-Laplace sums, and also you also have a median summation attached to this direction, singular direction pi over 2. In fact, you have many of them in general. Uh, Ecal has defined an, an array of average operators which are Good. I mean, the good property is that um, we, a convergent series is mapped to its usual sum. It's a summation operator. And uh, a product of formal series is mapped to the pointwise product of the corresponding functions. There is this homomorphism property. And these average operators satisfy it. So that's non-trivial. Now, in our example, the median summation will boil down to the arithmetic average of the two lateral summations. So that happens in some situations. It's not always the case, but here that, that will happen due to some meromorphic function in the Xi plane in the background. Um, which means that in our case, we will have three canonical Borel-Laplace sums, the lateral right, the lateral left, and the median one out of one series. And in fact, we will have two series. <laughs> so here is a, an example. The Stirling series is a, a noble example of resurgent series. Indeed, its Borel transform is meromorphic, as you can see the formula here, with poles on the imaginary axis and the Laplace transform in direction theta equals 0 gives you back the logarithm of the normalized gamma function. Uh, I should say one thing about the domain this is in the Xi plane. Now, when you apply the Laplace transform uh, of something, um, this is for, you know, the Laplace kernel should be decaying. Real part of um, what is the Laplace kernel? You have uh, Xi over tau. So real part of exponential i theta over tau should be positive or larger than a constant. So that gives you, in the, in the 1 over tau variable, this is a half plane. But you can move theta. Here you see that when you move theta by Cauchy theorem, you don't change the result. So you can glue together the various functions which are defined in half planes in the 1 over tau variable, and you enlarge this way the domain of definition. For instance, here our gamma function, z, is the um, variable at infinity, and tau is 1 over z. So you have singularities all along the imaginary axis, but you can move your direction from 0 to almost pi over 2 and almost minus pi over 2. And this way, when you glue together the half planes, you get a cut plane, which is the complex plane minus, um, minus the negative reals and the origin. Well, as you expect, for the logarithm of the gamma function, uh, you have a cut, yes. <laughs> uh, so that's consistent. Here is a less elementary example, uh, just for the fun. It, it won't be used in that uh, talk. Uh, using the two branches of the Lambert W function. If you don't know the Lambert W function, I refer you to the, um, the poster. There is a nice picture somewhere in the corridor. Uh, with you, all you have to know on the Lambert function is on that, um, that picture. Um, so these are, this is a singular function. Um, and you evaluate the difference of the two branches at minus exponential, minus 1, minus xi. Why on earth do you do that? Because this happens to be what will, prov 
the, the Borel transform of the normalized gamma function, not the logarithm. You know, the, the, the logarithm of the normalized gamma function is resurgent, and it's a general theorem in Eccal theory that the exponential of a resurgent series is resurgent, and the exponential of the Borel Laplace sum is the Borel Laplace sum of its exponential, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in that situation, we know in advance that the normalized gamma function must be resurgent because it's the exponential of something resurgent. But what is less obvious is that it admits in the Borel plane such an explicit expression. Okay, that's nice. This is just an example. Um, something which is less well known, it's often very important to use not only the standard Laplace transform, but this uh, Hankel Laplace uh, transform. Well, it's very simple. Uh, instead of going from zero to infinity in direction theta, you go from theta direction theta minus two pi, you turn around the origin in the direct direction, and you go to infinity in direction theta. And you apply that, you see the formula is Laplace transform, but on that uh, Hankel contour, rotated Hankel contour. And you do that not with phi hat, which was the usual Borel transform, you do that with phi check. So what is phi check? Well, imagine, you are uh, used to um, the Laplace transform with your phi hat, which is integrable at the origin. I mean, that is required when you want to compute the Laplace transform at, in the, at the origin. You cannot ha admit a too wide singularity. But then it will not be difficult to find some function phi check whose monodromy, whose variation is exactly phi hat. And in that situation, clearly, if phi check is nicely behaved at the origin, you can prove that formula. That is, the usual Laplace transform has been recast in the form of this Hankel Laplace transform applied to phi check. So um, Eccal's terminology is that phi hat is the minor, phi check is the major. So the minor and the major. This is Eccal's terminology. So example, uh, if your phi hat is regular, at the origin, you just multiply by logarithm divided by two pi. If it has a non-integer power, then, well, you correct that so that the monodromy will give you what you want. So you can do that with any integrable germ, but you can do it with non-integrable germ, and then you extend the frame, the scope of Laplace transform, of Borel Laplace summation to a larger uh, realm. So when you do that, for instance, with um, uh, tau to the c plus one, when now it's no longer an infinitesimal monomial, you can assume that real part of c is less than one, minus one, sorry. So you can apply, uh, assume that this is a large monomial. You can assume it's tau to the minus in positive integer, and it still works. I mean, you cannot do it with the usual Laplace transform, but you can do it with the Hankel Laplace transform, and this is useful to extend Borel Laplace summation. So I use these triangles to remember that I have. I am using now the major formalism instead of the usual minor formalism. And this is required to encode singularities via Eccles alien operators. This is my last slide on the reminders. Um, what is an alien operator in Eccles theory? So here is one example, uh, delta omega plus is defined this way. You take the inverse Borel transform of something, well, the generalized Borel transform. What is it? Um, well, you apply it to, um, it's an operator which maps a resurgent series to a resurgent series, and it depends on the point omega on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. So you fix omega, and you take one of these resurgent series, you compute its minor, so min here means minor of the Borel transform. So that is the usual thing you know, in fact. Uh, the minor is nothing new. You follow its analytic continuation near omega, but here you have to choose along which path you follow it, because remember, we allow for multivaluedness when we are speaking of resurgent functions. So what is this path gamma omega plus? It means you go straight toward omega, but if you meet singularities on your way, you circumvent them on the right. The plus means circumvent to the right. So this is the definition of the path gamma omega plus. Imagine xi is very small, 
maybe xi has argument uh, equal to argument of omega minus pi. So you are going just before omega, but in between you have circumvented those singularities. You have performed this translation, omega plus xi, and now you treat that as a major. You view it as something you would apply the Hankel Laplace transform, etc. So you can compute its inverse extended Borel transform, and that is a new series, and it's not difficult to convince oneself that this series automatically is resurgent, because before applying the inverse uh, extended Borel transform, clearly that was also endlessly continuable, because it was obtained from an endlessly continuable function by following the analytic continuation, shifting the variable. So this is consistent. This is an, op an internal operator from resurgent series to resurgent series. And why is it useful? Because of that formula here. I mean, this is the situation we are interested in. You see, we have the lateral uh, right summation, the lateral left. What is the difference? Simply the difference. What is S theta minus S theta prime? Well, clearly this is a contour integral. And this contour integral, we push the in integral path um, upward and you see contributions of each singular point. But the point is that uh, you see the contribution of the analytic continuation of the thing which was here, were always to the right. And then once you have reached, for instance, omega 2, you see I have reached it by circumventing to the right. And now I'm doing, um, well, to the left or to the left, but uh, two branches. So this is a Hankel Laplace integral attached to omega 2. So if I do the translation here, I get an, an exponential. So this is the formula, well, the well-known trans series expression for the difference of two Borel Laplace sums in terms of alien operators delta omega plus. So these are alien operators. If your function happens to be meromorphic in the psi variable, then they coincide with the delta omega. Maybe you heard about the delta omega. They are the alien derivations. Derivations in the sense that they map a product to um, Leibniz rule. Derivation in the algebraic sense, which is quite remarkable. Well, the idea is that these Laplace operators map product to product. So here, somehow, we are doing Laplace in a direction composed with Laplace, the inverse of the other Laplace. So there is an automorphism here, which is the Stokes automorphism, and these delta omega correspond to a logarithm of that graded automorphism in the appropriate uh, graded algebra, etc. Okay, general theory and of my uh, reminder, let's see what happens to our uh, partial theta series. Let us see. Uh, so you remember, well, maybe you don't remember, <laughs> and I would forgive you. Uh, we are interested in theta of tau, which also depends. There is an exponent, uh, a periodic function of period m, and it was n power nu uh, fn, but the sum is restricted to positive integers. And then you have the exponential i pi n square, which is the particular feature of theta series, tau over m. So this is our function, and this quantity, maybe you call it a n. So this was our uh, partial theta series. And what we will get is, you remember I told you, the mean value at the origin will tell you whether or not the limit exists. It's because there is this obstruction, tau raised to a negative power, but in front you have mean value of f. And that's an exact formula. So you have a decomposition into three parts. So this potentially singular part, but controlled by the mean value. And then a median sum of some resurgent series. So there will be a resurgent series theta tilde plus, and it will be resurgent with a Borel transform like that. So the median summation here is, refers to the singular direction pi over 2, plus something else, the difference of two Borel Laplace sums in two nearby directions for another uh, resurgent series, uh, theta minus. So you see, 
And it's not our choice. I mean, it's not that we found a, an asymptotic series and we decided we would use this Laplace transform or that one. It's, it's like that. Uh, automatically, the function decomposes, decomposes itself like that. So, which means that, for instance, this median summation doesn't necessarily give you the result. Maybe you have to correct it by this, but you see that this will be exponentially small. It's a difference of two Borel-Laplace sums. It is exponentially small with respect to tau as tau goes to zero non-tangentially. Whereas this guy is very tame when tau goes to zero, it has a nice asymptotic expansion, in that case uh, with integer powers of tau, non-negative integer powers. So, well, this is written here. Um, well, let me emphasize that theta tilde minus this exponentially small correction depends only on the even part of the sequence a n. And so nu, we said nu is zero or one, so the function f will be maybe even, maybe odd, or maybe the sum of two parts. So you have to select the even or the odd part of f to compute the even part of n, of a n. And this will somehow dictate modularity properties. Well, you know maybe that full theta series enjoy remarkable modularity properties, and we will find them through this framework. That's the fun. Um, what about the median Borel sum, sum in, in the second term here? It depends only on the odd part, and it will be responsible for quantum modularity properties in the sense of uh, Don Zagier's theory. Uh, so let me illustrate that with an example. So this is a famous function in number theory, the Dedekind eta function. Eta is defined, you see my notation, I choose exponent nu equal to zero, the period is 12, and the periodic function chi has a support which has only four points per period. So between uh, 1 and 12, you have only 1, 5, 7, 11, and the values are 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. So you see that it is clearly even. It is clearly even. Hence, and the mean value is zero, that's clear. Uh, so you don't have the first term, you don't have the second term, you only have the difference of these Borel-Laplace sums. Well, you, you know that the difference of Laplace um, sums will be re recast as a sum of exponentially small terms, and you see this normalization uh, tau square over m makes it so that the exponentials are exactly i pi m square over 12 tau. That is to say, the same expression as for eta, but evaluated at minus one over tau, exactly the same, up to a factor which is tau over i to the minus one half, and this is a famous formula. This is the modularity property of the Dedekind eta function, modular with weight one half, because this exponent here, minus one half, you, you put it on the other side and you are saying that eta applied to minus one over tau, this uh, very uh, important modular transformation coincides with the product of eta of tau multiplied by tau over i raised to that power one half. So this is the modularity, which is quite extraordinary because, of course, the eta function is periodic with period uh, 24, of course. It, it's defined by a Fourier series. But when you, so when you map tau to tau plus 24, even if you map tau to tau plus one, you can figure out what the result is. But mapping tau to minus one over tau, this is kind of a surprise, well, a surprise which has been <laughs> around for quite a few centuries. But now, let's look at this eta tilde. Eta tilde has been called by Zagir the Eichler integral of eta. You see, the only difference is that I use nine nu equal to one. So now I'm dealing with an odd sequence I n, so uh, I don't have, I, no, I have no more the, the, the first term, of course, uh, it doesn't exist. In, but now it's the second term, only the second term. So I have a different series and I use the median summation. So which means that this eta tilde has a limit which is given by the first term of the series and behind this limit there is a nice asymptotic expansion with integer powers of tau. So where is the modularity here? Well, if it's a median summation, in that case, it's just the arithmetic average. So you can rephrase it as the lateral right summation minus half the difference. And half the difference, that will be a sum of exponentially small quantities, 
they will happen to be very much related to eta tilde of tau, but eta tilde at minus one over tau again, by the same gain. Something very similar happens, but the exponent will be three half instead of one half, so we will have a quantum modular form of weight three half. Maybe this is explained later in the slides. Well, quantum modularity was discovered by Zagier when considering precisely that function eta tilde. Uh, there is this uh, strange identity paper in 2001. And about this eta tilde, we have here Ovidiu, who has worked on it uh, in this paper, Resurgence of the Konsevich Zagier series. There was another particularly illuminating instance of that phenomenon. Now it's period 60. So that's another example treated by Zagier and Lawrence in 1999. Uh, you see the period is 60, and uh, it's an odd periodic function, which I call here f plus. So this is the support. Between 1 and 60, you only have these eight points, and you see that the, the function is clearly odd. Um, so of course, zero mean value. Um, so we will have the same business. It will be uh, at tau going to zero, represented by only a median summation. And by the way, if you change your base point, instead of zero, you take alpha. Well, you shift everything and you have a new periodic function, still odd. So you still have the same decomposition, but with a new series. So that was interesting because it's related to quantum invariance of three manifolds. So this is the business known as topological quantum field theory. Um, so more precisely, there is the gukov tay putrov Bafa invariant. So this is for the Poincaré homology sphere, and this is uh, SU2C Chern Simon theory. So the link with resurgence was observed in a preprint in 2016 by Gukov Marino Putrov uh, for that Poincaré homology sphere and for another three manifolds. So these are Briscorn spheres, they have the same homology as the standard sphere but uh, the point is to find invariants, which make a discrimination between their topological types. And um, Anderson and Mr. Gard very recently have worked on those um, ideas, and they have established the same resurgence phenomenon for any fiber Zeifert homology sphere. I mean, well, we, we are working together now to try to put together our, our ideas. Um, so I think um, this, well, okay, on that picture, on that slide, let's just focus on that. You remember the story of the non-tangential uh, limit at the, the, the limit function at the rationals, at some rationals, in the case of an odd periodic function, at all rationals, because the mean value is always zero, you have a, a limit value. So you define a function on the rationals, which is called theta non-tangential. Now you have the, modularity or the quantum modularity property. Well, this is interesting because the value of those limit functions at one over k, so I, sp I pick a rational of the form one over integer, that is related with the witten reshetikin turayev invariant of level k. So people were interested in those quantities for that reason. And now, um, well, that's good because um, due to the quantum modularity property, there is a relation between that uh, quantity at k with the limit function at minus k, which is a much simpler object. That's a periodic function of k of period 2m. It has uh, Fourier modes, finitely many. So you can write beautiful formulas relating the value at my 1 over k and the value at minus k, but not modular relations, not as simple as for eta, but more in the spirit of eta tilde, uh, quantum modular, which means that um, the modularity um, discrepancy, the obstruction, the function is not modular, but when you do the difference, which would be zero for a modular function, you get something which happens to have a nice analytic continuation through the reals. That's the point, that's the definition of quantum modularity. So the modular obstruction, the quantity which is not zero because the function is not quite modular, happens to have a nice analytic continuation outside of the Poincaré uh, half plane. Um, okay, let's skip all this and uh, let's go to the um, technicalities a little bit. I don't want to, uh, to be too boring. Um, there is a first auxiliary result which is very nice. How does it work? 
um, you take your uh, sequence a n, and instead of doing the um, partial theta series, you do the usual generating series with exponential minus t, minus n t. So that, if a n is uh, well behaved, that's holomorphic and bounded in uh, in the right half planes. So you have a nice function of t. And moreover, if f a n is n times a periodic function, there will be, it will be a rational function of exponential minus t. It's a very nice function of t. And the point is that when you compute that function at c times square root of xi, where xi is this constant with argument pi over 4, you get and you multiply by xi to the minus one half, then you get a function phi hat whose integral along that contour, you see it's a Laplace-like integral again, will give you theta of tau. So the, this is the, one of the key formula. Theta of tau happens to be represented as a Laplace-like integral of phi hat obtained by that recipe. And the contour here it runs from argument minus three pi over two plus something to pi over two minus something. So you see, um, of course, it's on the Riemann surface of uh, the logarithm or, or of the square root at least. But the point is that our function f of t, it's, it's good in the half plane. So argument between minus pi over two and plus pi over two. So when I compute it uh, here, you see, xi is allowed, allowed to have arguments between minus three pi over two and plus pi over two because I take the square root, so that gives me minus three pi over four and pi over four, and I add pi over four coming from C. So I, this argument is really in the right half plane. So I am entitled to evaluate F, and that's the result. And that is extremely easy to prove. Um, okay, maybe we won't get into all the details, but just look at the first three lines. I mean, the, this is the whole proof, 12 lines. But the very starting point is that um, you, we will sum functions of tau of that form, exponential uh, sigma squared tau, where sigma is uh, n times something. Uh, and we have inserted in front this tau to the one half. Why? Because this is an analytic function of tau at the origin. Hence, it coincides with the Borel-Laplace sum of its Taylor series. And with convergent series, Borel-Laplace sum works, of course. So let's compute the Borel transform. And because I have inserted this tau to the one half, in the Borel transform, I have a factorial p coming from the exponential series, and I have a, a gamma of p plus one half. And I can group them together, and I have a factorial of two p, and this is why I have a nice formula with exponentials evaluated at xi to the one half. That's the point. I mean, and then you do the computation and it's 12 lines and you end up with that uh, nice uh, formula. So we want to apply that formula to our partial theta series. Let's do it. Again, it's a bit technical. So, okay, let's look at the highlighted lines. We are starting with this. So we apply the recipe. First, compute the generating series that will be a nice um, rational function of exponential minus t. Now, we take the square root of xi, multiply by c, and this will give the formula. Um, okay, what is phi hat? That's the point. What is phi hat? It's the sum of three terms, one singular term, xi is raised to a power which is less than, uh, well, which is minus one or less, so it's non-integrable, but it has the mean value of f in front, plus something which comes from the odd part or the even part of uh, f plus xi to minus one half times something. I mean, the point with phi hat minus and phi hat plus, why this decomposition is because, you know, I have inserted this xi to the one half. Uh, but now both phi plus and phi minus are regular at the origin. So phi hat minus is regular and phi hat plus is regular, but multiply by xi to the minus one half, which is still integrable. So I can compute my Laplace-like integral now using Cauchy theorem and going through the origin. I have no trouble with that. Um, so what is the result? Oh, another point which you should pay attention to is that 
you find phi plus and phi minus meromorphic on the complex plane with poles as announced on the upper part of the imaginary axis. So what is the end result? Uh, a decomposition of theta into three pieces. And you work out the details and you see that theta minus, well, it's not yet um, a Laplace transform. What is it exactly? Well, it's an integral along gamma. You remember this gamma which goes far from the origin. Now, the, the game is the following. You can move this path upward and in the case of phi hat minus, because it is regular at the origin, you just have the difference. I mean, you integrate uh, in that diff well, well, but be careful with, with this. I should have written here minus 3 pi. Uh, here, I should have written minus 3 pi over 2 plus epsilon. And I have written pi over 2 plus epsilon because phi hat minus is regular. There is no difference. So it's a difference of Laplace transform, obviously exponentially small. But in the case of theta plus, there is a change of branch because you remember theta plus we multiply by this psi to the minus one half. So when I reach the origin, I am this ray with direction minus three pi over two plus epsilon and it becomes pi over two plus epsilon with a plus sign due to the change of branch. This is why theta plus happens to be a median summation, simply that. And this is the result I had uh, announced here. OK, let me uh, accelerate a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, every, you have three, three Borel-Laplace sums in the picture for each series. Let's take, let's take um, the lateral right summation. So when you move your direction by Cauchy theorem, you follow the analytic continuation outside of the Poincaré plane. Initially, you are limited in the Poincaré plane because your direction is very close to pi over two. So argument of tau must be essentially between zero and pi. But moving, varying the direction, you can cross the positive real axis and reach, in fact, you, you can have a, a sector of opening three pi. Very nice. So in the end, uh, this function has a, an extension through the positive reals. Uh, similarly, the lateral left summation has an extension through the negative reals. But when you want to consider them simultaneously, as you will in the case of the difference or of the sum, then you are restricted to the Poincaré upper half plane. You cannot have both simultaneously, both extensions. Now I want to show you the alien derivatives in action in that problem. I first need an auxiliary tool, which is the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform operator. I mean, after all, we are dealing with periodic sequences on the integers. Uh, I defined um, this unitary operator, which maps um, even function to even function. And in restriction, it is an involution. It maps odd functions to odd function. And in restriction, it's an anti-involution. So it's a nice uh, involution or anti-involution. And then, why do I need it? Because I, I had uh, at some point, you know, uh, the generating function in the T variable, it was meromorphic with poles, simple poles, and the residuum is given by the DFT of the even part of the function F. Uh, that's for um, the residue. Uh, so what do I have written here? I don't remember exactly. Uh, probably there is, yes, yes, we need to distinguish the odd part and the even part of the generating function. So this is why you have two, two formulas. And from that, you get the behavior, the shape of the singularity of the Borel transform of theta plus. Because remember, theta plus was essentially obtained from uh, mm, phi plus, etc. So, well, let me show you the result uh, because uh, I'm running out of time. Well, it depends on your exponent nu. If nu is zero, uh, which means you are, theta plus will depend only on the even part of f, and the alien derivative, or alien derivative with a plus or without a plus, it's the same here, is proportional to tau to the minus one half, and the coefficient in front is essentially the DFT of the odd part at n. Whereas, when nu is one, you must use the even part of f, and its DFT is multiplied by n, 
and the exponent is three halves, which means, what does it mean, this one half? And what does it mean to have an alien derivative which is proportional to tau to the minus one half? It means that when you go to the Borel transform, you follow the analytic continuation, you reach the point xi n after circumvented the, the, the singularities, you see something singular which has one over square root of xi, one over square root. Uh, and these three halves, uh, sorry, one over the cube of the square root, and this is one of the fifth power, I mean, the Borel-Laplace dictionary. You have to work out the formula. Uh, so we are describing here the singularity, the shape of the singularities at those points. I mean, alien calculus is just that. It's very concrete, you see. And similarly, uh, for uh, theta minus still, we have formulas. We can compute the alien derivatives because we have everything. And if we wish, we can go to uh, higher exponents, new, because um, there is a nice relation between uh, d over d tau and the alien derivative. This is standard alien calculus. Now, I want to conclude with uh, the bridge equations. <laughs> um, we, you remember the formula um, when you go from lateral right to lateral left, there is a, an, an expression for the difference in terms of a trans series involving contribution of the singularities. Uh, in fact, the contribution of the singularities is measured by the directional alien derivative. This, this is the, the operator you need. So when u is zero, you apply that operator to measure the difference uh, of the two Borel-Laplace sums. Well, uh, when you apply that operator to theta, theta tilde plus, what you get is this tau over i to the minus one half. You remember all the singularities are proportional to tau to the minus one half. And, well, the coefficient, you can regroup them together and you find exactly, whoop, <laughs> I still have one minute, I think. Is it correct? I have, how much do I have? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes, whoa, excellent. Um, where was I? <laughs> I was with the bridge equation, yes. Well, these exponentially small terms are just a new theta series evaluated at minus one over tau, but it's a different one. It's, you started with f, and here you have the dft of the odd part. Here you have the dft of the even part. That's the trick. But of course, you can assume that your function is odd or even, you can, by linearity. But then you have to understand what is its dft. Uh, this way you can prove modularity. I mean, modularity when f is even is a consequence of that bridge equation. Well, and it's more fun to look at the quantum modularity. What does it mean? Suppose that the mean value is zero for the sake of simplicity. Suppose you are in the odd case. So this half sum of Borel transform is just one of them minus one half the difference. And the difference due to the bridge equation happens to be exactly a theta series evaluated at minus one over tau. Hence, we are saying that the quantity which was zero in the modular case, now it's non-zero, but it's just the lateral right summation or the lateral left summation as you wish. Um, and so yes, it has a nice clear, a nice analytic continuation through the reals on the right or on the left automatically from standard Borel-Laplace uh, methods. So this is the key to uh, understanding quantum modularity in that case. Uh, and I conclude, yes, with that nice consequence. I mentioned the WRT invariant at level k. You, you remember, evaluate the limit function at one over k. That's the instruction. Well, at one over k, we write the formula. We have the modular obstruction. And here we have the, um, the modular term. So there is a relation between what happens at 1 over k and what happens at minus k. But the difference is not 0. It's something which is nothing but the la lateral Borel sum evaluated at 1 over k. 1 over k tends to 0. When k tends to infinity, this term has the usual. Uh, uh, there is only one. Uh, asymptotic series in that problem. So we understand that the rest, uh, WRT invariant at 1 over k enjoys kind, kind of uh, a nice asymptotic expansion property when k tends to infinity up to that term. That term 
here, well, it's a modulated periodic term. There is this quai k to the one half, and then there is a, a periodic sequence of k, period uh, 2m, you remember. So we understand now the asymptotic of the WRT invariant at level k from this business. Of course, this has been, uh, had been understood by Zagir and others with different methods, but I'm trying here to convince you that indeed um, the resurgent framework is a nice way to Mm, group together to, mm, to understand these, these results. So let me skip the work in progress and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, David, for the beautiful talk where the resurgent world and the modular world meet. And um, there, any questions or comments, please? Thank you very much for uh, opening a completely new world to me. Um, uh, for once, it really gives me, um, makes me want to know more about all this. And since I don't know anything about it, I will dare for once to ask a stupid question. Uh, when I see your theta function, it, it really looks like uh, the formal solution of the wave equation on a finite domain with an initial condition that is the, uh, whose uh, Fourier series is given by the ANs and M is mm, like the square root of the length of, of the domain and therefore I was asking if there was some uh, equivalence between evaluating this theta function using this mathematics and somehow uh, solving the wave equation in this domain and let it forward let it forward in time. Uh, the wave equation, I think in, in that context, what comes naturally would be the, the heat equation if you insert an extra variable, but I, I imagine, well, anyway, all that is with complex variables anyway. So there is something with the heat equation, definitely, which I didn't, uh, I mean, <laughs> In 50 minutes, I certainly could not uh, speak of that also. And uh, I would say, if you insert another variable, indeed, you have a function of two variables satisfying a PDE, and that's interesting. But then the resurgent pattern in the Xi variable will move when the other variable moves, which makes it a slightly different problem. So here we were doing the things directly in variable tau and nothing else. But one can and one should insert an extra variable and look at what happens when the extra variable is non-zero. And that might be related to your question. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes. Sorry. Go back to your first slide with the definition of the theta function. Yeah. Yeah. So if your function's a n is 1, mm -hmm. then of course you've got the ordinary theta function, and then you just use the Poisson transformation, and then presumably all of the sophisticated features just collapse to nothing, right? Because it's then identical, it's then an identity. Yes, well, so I mean, all these collapse to the Poisson nothing summation. Nothing is then it. divergent and straight, right? Um, no, no, you still have a divergent series. I mean, this is the even case with no, exponent nu equals zero. No, for so finite imaginary tor. But, I mean, the your standard theta function with all a n equal to one yes. is up to the mean value term. I mean, the first term n equals zero has to be um, removed. It is the difference of two Borel-Laplace sums of one no, divergent sorry, I don't series. I understand that because uh, this is just my first question. But so, but if a n is one, you've just got the ordinary uh, ordinary theta function, which yeah. you, and then it's Poisson transform. Nothing is divergent. You get two exponential series, each convergent if the imaginary part of tor is um, I I I is positive. Well, and, uh, uh, you don't need any of the sophistication. I don't say you need it, but it's a fact that the, the formula applies, and the first 
uh, term is non-zero because there mm. is a, a mean value. The second term is zero, but there is a divergent series for the full the well, theta I series. I understand it because Poisson summation is exact. You've got two. Yeah, and indeed that's exactly the same phenomenon as for the Dedekind eta function. That's the same phenomenon. I mean, in the Dedekind eta function, it's essentially the same. You have the function is the difference of two Borel Laplace sums, and these two. So it's exponentially small when tau tends to zero. Uh, once you have removed uh, the leading uh, term. And then this difference, exponentially small, can be rewritten as the function itself evaluated at minus one over tau. And when tau tends to zero, minus one over tau tends to infinity, and indeed it's exponentially but anyway, small. Anyway, so if instead of uh, uh, mm. one, you have the function is one up to some finite integer capital N and then zero. So oh. this is an incomplete theta function. Now then we know in great detail what happens because you can do Poisson and integral, whatever. Mm. And then you get a, a, then you have a renormalized uh, fractal function. And we know essentially everything about it. Some of the results go back to uh, uh, Littlewood and Hardy, but some of them don't. And uh, you get a very rich arithmetic structure. Um, and I don't see any of that in your general theory. So I don't know where it is. So do you know uh, what I mean? I, I, I'm speaking about, I learned this, these incomplete things from Mendes France, Pierre Man uh -huh. uh, Michel okay. Mendes France, long ago. And then Distinguished with uh, Joel Goldberg yeah. developed in enormous detail the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the successive iterations. It's Poisson plus number theory, Poisson plus number theory, and you go on. And uh, there's a very rich structure at each stage of which the capital N is gets smaller and smaller. And eventually when it reaches one, you reach the limit. And uh, that reveals an enormous richness of arithmetic structure, which if, if you plot it out, if you plot mm -hmm. these complex fun as a functions of n, you, you see all this structure. And I wonder where all of that is hidden in what you're describing. I'm afraid I have thrown that richness at the, at the offset, at the, at the outset, because <laughs> uh, I have assumed that my sequence was periodic. And here you are... No, periodic in... In, in n, f of n is periodic in ah, n. Ah, ah, ah. But so maybe one could, <laughs> one should, in fact, what is still true is that we you still have the, the formula. Where is the formula? B, I mean, that f so that doesn't apply because um, your sequence is not periodic in n, it terminates, but you can still apply that formula and look okay, at what okay. happens when your capital, you have an n, you have a parameter n that you, so it would be quite, I mean, I ignore totally what you are saying. I mean, I didn't know about uh, Mendes France work about those, uh, Thank you very uh, much. but incomplete, but I, I'll have a look. I mean, maybe you can give me the reference. I, I'm curious about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think, we, oh yeah, yeah. Sally, just well, maybe once. With the Henkel, uh, the Henkel Laplace contour that you defined, uh, that that would not very be very helpful for convolutions, right? Because it, you oh, it works through the. Con I mean, you just have to modify to extend the convolution. Yes, it works with convolution. It does. I mean, but but then yeah. Uh, you have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ekal has given the formulas for the major, so. Uh, I, I assume your question is... So the s in the C domain, you have to have an extended, uh, you know, you can't, it can't be just defined on, a, on the line because when you do the convolution and with, with, this, with this contour, it takes you off the contour. So you have, to, you have to have a more extended region where the functions are defined, correct? So you are speaking of the convolution of... Um, so of uh, so you take minus. The, yeah, you take the convolution, uh, and you are trying to uh, uh, you are trying to um, uh, de de define the convolution. So it's not complete on a curve. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like it is on a on a straight line. Well, in resurgent theory, we manipulate convolution all the time because convolution is the Borel image of multiplication. Mm -hmm. We often manipulate it at the level of minus, mm -hmm. but it goes through the machinery and you can define the convolution at the level of majors, but the formula is more complicated. So my answer would be probably we can do it, 
uh, with the right interpretation of what it should be. But, but it's non-trivial, it's non-trivial. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we can speak uh, David again.